Let's be quiet. Yes, she did you like what's the name of them did Jay-Z and Beyonce, huh? <laughs> all right, so first of all, I sound like a well, like so 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 thank you all for being uh, the most recent uh, participants in our I Have a Testimony series. This actually started uh, talking to Brother Jesse, played a role in it as well. Uh, the album Minister Louis Farrakhan talking about his witness bearers being silent. Mm -hmm. And then we were uh, at a hotel in Houston and Sister Claudette. Y'all have Sister Claudette book? Yes. <laughs> if y'all didn't, I was going to give y'all a copy. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sister Claudette's book, um, the minister wrote the foreword, but he was telling her like how, you know, he had heard. Were well, you at the table when he was doing that? Well, he was saying that. Um, you know, he doesn't get this opportunity to hear those stories about the believers. So that puts right. something on my mind about, you know, starting this. And I think just more people just need to hear our testimony. We need to document this stuff, yes, right? Sir. And everybody got like, we have a different insight about the minister, but our own stories are unique as well. Yes, so everybody that comes into the city, uh, we give them the opportunity. Initially, we will allow them just to, it will be like a lecture format. But we had an experience with somebody that just was, it went way this <laughs> way. They had to start asking some questions to yeah. get them back on the, yeah, the right. test. So then we started doing the interview. So this is the third interview stop we did. Uh, the first one was with Brother Don. Then Brother Rashad was in the, in the city. His daughter was leaving Xavier University. So that was uh, last Friday mm -hmm. they did it. So this is the third one. So we thank you all. But y'all are the first husband and wife together. The two yeah. that we've ever done like this. So the first thing we'll, we will start off with... Uh, just how did you come to how did you, how did you come to to accept the teachings? Um, I was introduced to the teachings of Honorable Elijah Muhammad by my biological brother, who is the former study group coordinator, student minister in the city. He actually started, uh, opened up the city, mm -hmm. um, the known nation of Islam there prior since 1975. Mm -hmm. In fact, the local city leadership said, because there was an incident where a police officer got killed by one of the FOI mm -hmm. in 75, and they may had made a declaration that they would never let the Nation of Islam return uh, back to the city. But I was in high school, and my brother uh, gave me the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And then, after reading that, he introduced me to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan by way of VHS take the, the historic Don, Donahue interview. And from that, I began the progression of, you know, picking up books, listening to the minister. And that same year, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan visited the University of Texas. And I was sitting in the audience. After that, we formed a, an official study group in the city of Austin. I was processing. It wasn't until a, a, a traumatic event that I had personally. I was still in high school, but when I graduated, um, I ended up seeing one of my friends killed. We were processing together. And we were still no mosques, no older believers there. So it was just a bunch of children, you know, playing Muslim which was really like a club or a group or a clique or something like that. And after we graduated from high school, we went down to Houston and um, got into it with some individuals who ended up, you know, coming, finding us at a stoplight and, sh and shot into the vehicle mm -hmm. many times. And everybody in the vehicle was hit except me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best friend of mine was sitting in the back seat with me. I shot eight times. Mm -hmm. And so, but it was that moment that changed the trajectory of my life when I did had to, I felt like I had to make the decision of if I was going to straddle this fence of the world or give my life, you know, to Allah through the nation of Islam. And it was that, I believe, that shock of the hour that mm -hmm. propelled me into becoming registered and taking Islam and the study and development myself seriously. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So your brother helped to <coughs> reestablish it post 75 and you helped to bring it to my status. Yes, sir. That's amazing. Yeah. Sis. 
Yes, sir. Thank you for having us. That's this no problem. Is, this is wonderful. wonderful. Yes, sir. Um, I, uh, interestingly, because today you mentioned, uh, uh, today when you were opening up, that it is um, the birth uh, day of uh, Malcolm X. Um, and that was how I came into the nation. Um, because, you know, the during that time, the 1990s, uh, mid-90s, the enemy was resurrecting Malcolm mm -hmm. with the right. purpose of trying to pit him against the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the nation. And so I always say that I'm a personal example, and I know there are many, of every knock is a boost. Mm -hmm. Because their attempt to pull us away from the nation is exactly what brought me to the nation. So I was a student at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I was 19 years old, and I was a sophomore, and I was just, I started to get interested in Malcolm. The movie was out, the autobiography was republished. And so I read it, I read it many times and I watched the movie and I started reading books about Malcolm, uh, Judas Factor. Then I got into the, the, the COINTELPRO, FBI files, all of that stuff. And I was just really into it. But what really attracted me, um, what I realized was the Malcolm that was in the nation and not the one who, who had left. And so I wanted to know, where is the nation today? You know, what are they doing, you know? And so a friend of mine a knew a brother, a Robert's brother, Brother Cedric, and it, what, what was funny is uh, myself and Brother Robert's brother were both working at Dell uh, Computers at the time. It was a summer job uh, for me. And he said, uh, we were all there, and um, uh, my friend, and he said that, he said, there he is right there. That's the head of the nation in Austin right there. And I said, that little old boy. <laughs> <laughs> now, he's a few years older than me, but I was 19, so he was, you know, 23, something like that. And I was like, how is he the head of the nation of Islam? But anyway, so, um, so long story short, I attended my first meeting, and... I was nervous about going in, and I, I sat there because my friend was supposed to come with me, and I was not going in until he showed up. I was not going in by myself. And you know how the brothers, they come and get your door. So I was like, oh, I got to go in. <laughs> so I went in by myself. He didn't come to the end of the meeting. And so I came in. It was a Sunday meeting. Um, brother Cedric, his brother, was doing the lecture, and I was just blown away by what I heard. Mm -hmm. And I never stopped coming wow. back. I came on Wednesday. We had Wednesday night study, but we had it at the library. Then I came on Friday. I came back on. So I just kept coming. And but you know, I was still Malcolm, Malcolm, Malcolm. You know. And so, Sister Dr. Stacy now, um, who's in Houston, she uh, was also a student at UT. She was two years ahead of me. And she said, I have a tape I want you to listen to. <laughs> and so she gave me my very first audio cassette tape of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And it was titled Malcolm X, 28 Years Later, What Really Happened? And so I heard that tape. And you know, because I, I thought I was conscious. I was, you know, I was woke, as they say today. I could quote Malcolm and thought I knew Malcolm. I heard that lecture from the minister, and I was just like, whoa, wow. <laughs> I saw and I heard from someone who really walked with Malcolm and really loved Malcolm and really understood him. And so my view just completely changed. And But that was my only tape, so I listened to it over and over and over again, wore it out, have that lecture memorized to this day. That's how much I listened to it. But um, I was stuck then. That was it. That was it for me. And so, but I, I never stopped coming to the to the, um, to the meetings, I asked, um, um, I don't know how many questions. I always had questions because I was just, I needed to, I thought I needed to understand everything before accepting. It took me about five months before I started processing. And then when I processed, I quickly got registered and here we are. How did your parents respond? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was, in, you know, when I was in high school, so, you know, you still your parents baby mm -hmm. and then I'm, I'm the youngest out of the two of us and so um, but with him bringing me in but see I was at a juncture in my life where my brother was always a, a good brother mm -hmm. I mean he was always a, a guide for me and but 
you know, I was a little rebellious. So I was at a juncture in my life where I was either going to join the Nation of Islam or I was about to be a criminal. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget because after having the 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 minister introduced to me via via uh, VHS, there was a moment in time, and you know I grew up in the '80s, so everybody, pretty much in my family, all of my friends, everybody sold drugs. Mm -hmm. That's that's just what they did, and except for my brother, mm -hmm. and he was always when he was showing me these things. I would not let him know that I was attracted to it. And when he was playing the Donahue interview, I was in the kitchen cooking a pork chop. <laughs> and I remember looking around the corner in the kitchen, and it, I mean, that, this is the words I use. I said, who is that N-word? Mm -hmm. You know, but I was blown away. And so that was the last time I remember eating swine. But our parents, you know, like most parents, because the, the way we're kind of, I was kind of brought in was to dispel all of the myths and the untruths about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so, because I grew up in church, mm -hmm. we were, uh, we went to church every Sunday. We were, uh, I was in the junior choir, I was a junior deacon. I was, uh, 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 helped to teach Sunday school in a certain form, but I was an inquisitive kind of young man. And so, but as we got older, you know, that construct couldn't deal with the, 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 the fire and the energy inside, as you see, and that was the days during the Rodney King verdict mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. And so what we were getting in church was not, was not speaking to these things. But when I heard Donald Lewis Farrakhan, he, he was. And then, you know, in the music, Public Enemy, Farrakhan's a prophet that I think you ought to listen to, Poor Righteous Teachers. All of that during the late 80s, early 90s mm -hmm. had an effect on my mind and my psyche. But it wasn't powerful enough to pull us away from the drug trade and the drug trafficking. So I remember when I was in high school, as a high school senior, cousins of mine picked me up and we went. I was at two a day football practice. So I'm going into the locker room. I don't have any shirt on. I've got on practice pants, shorts. And they told me to get in the car. So I got in the car. We went to the Mercedes Benz dealer. I didn't have a shirt on, I had a hat on backwards. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, what are we doing? They said, oh, come on. We're walking in. There's white people everywhere. And uh, it was about five of us. And my cousin counted 20 grand, put it on the table. And he drove off, signed his mother's name on a sheet of paper. And he drove off in a Mercedes. So I was at that junction. And so my parents believed, as well as I, that I was leaving the faith that they had given us and that they had worked so hard to embed in us, which was, you know, leaving the, the Christian faith, and so they didn't like it. My father, I remember, he had a bout with crack cocaine. He left home for about a year and a half. He came back, and his first mandate was, y'all had to go to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I remember we almost got into a physical altercation because I was angry because he left at the time where I felt like I needed my father. I was 17, 18 years old. And he was always there, but he wasn't, he, you know, him and my mom had, had issues because he had issues. And i never forget, he said, as long as I'm the man of this house, y'all going to church. And I got a quick mouth, and I said, well, you wasn't here when we moved here. <laughs> because they had split. Mm -hmm. And I saw a whole different side of him, and uh, uh, I thought I was going to die that day. <laughs> But they were in total disagreement with it because they thought we were going to hell, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, those common mistakes that you make when you're, when you're excited about what you learn, you try to go and disprove everything, you want to debate. And I grew up in a family full of preachers. Mm -hmm. So Thanksgiving, Christmas, all of that, we talking about the swine on the table. We, we talking about, you know, the Christmas tree, pulling it out of the forest like heathens and whatnot. And so, it was a problem, mm -hmm. you know. So my parents were not in agreement with uh, us being in the home and then riding by mm -hmm. the block and seeing us <laughs> with the final call newspaper. Mm -hmm. So it was a big problem mm -hmm. at that time. So and now I love it though. I see you post pictures of you. Absolutely love it. Yes, yes sir. Praise yes, sir. Praise yes, sir. Me too a lot. Yes, sir. 
Um, my, uh, my family, um, I'm, I was born in Sierra Leone um, in West Africa, and my, my family is, you know, they're products of colonization, you know, and so my family um, is a Christian. My father actually grew up Muslim. Uh, but he, uh, there, there's really no issue with Islam and Christianity until you decide to get married. So when he decided to marry my mother, the condition that my grandfather put on him was you had to convert to Christianity. So, you know, he was like, okay, I'm a Christian. So, <laughs> so we grew up Christian, but I say that uh, loosely because um, in our, in our house, my mother's father was a preacher. She went to, I mean, they went to church every day, you know. Um, and so um, in her mind, even though now she is in the church, you know, when you get older, you, you go back uh, to where you came from. But she, um, she felt like she was one of those people, I, you know, I, I know I'm, I'm not going to learn anything else. So when we're over here in the, in the States, I came when I was two. They brought us when I was two and my sister was about uh, three and a half. They, my mother felt um, like you all need Jesus and, and, um, and church. And so she would send us to church. So I always say the difference between me and my husband, he grew up to the, in, in the church, but I went to church. And so, um, so we just, we went to church and we learned what we learned. The church bus would come pick us up. My mother never went, we just went. And so when I accepted Islam, though, all of a sudden, it was a really big problem. <laughs> it was a big problem in my house. And, you know, hindsight, you know, um, I thank a lot for my mother because she really, when you think about it, I did, if you, from her vantage point, I was doing some strange things. So, you know, all of a sudden I'm dressing, I'm covered from head to toe, and she's like, what in the world is going, what did she join? And, um, and I'm talking all this black stuff and, you know, and um, uh, Islam and whatnot. And so she was very nervous, very concerned, and then the thing that I did that really let her know I lost my mind was, I dropped out of school. Mm. What I do that for? <laughs> I dropped because I was like, I, you know, you know, we're just silly when we're young. You know, I don't need the, you know, I don't need all of this. You know, so I dropped out and I'm done with school. And so she was just like, oh, what, what is going on? And then two years after that. Um, uh, well, before that, let me tell you my father's reaction. My parents were divorced when I was about seven. And he wasn't around still. We, we don't really have a really close relationship. But um, when he popped back up in, in 96, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan blessed the believers with the name Muhammad. <laughs> That's when he showed up for real. <laughs> and so because it's only me and my sister. We're girls. And so... Um, even though I was like, if we got married, we would take the husband's name anyway, but he had a big issue with me changing my name from my, my, uh, uh, maiden name is Teray, my slave name. I can't really say slave name, but, um, um, my maiden name is Teray and I changed it to Muhammad. And that's when he had a big problem. My father, um, who does not live with my mother, they're divorced, came to my mother's house <laughs> and took, this is before, um, um, just before, I, we're recording, we may, yeah, we were recording, we were recording at the time. He took all of my garments, all of my garments, he put them in the trunk of his car, he said he was going to go dump them. So it was a big combative thing with my father. My mother was just looking at me, shaking her head, but she wasn't really like, you know, come at me. But my father was like, no, that's it, you know. And so, um, and so he would say negative things about the minister and whatnot. And so it was a mess for a while. But I have to tell you, it's amazing what just closing your mouth sometimes and just be an example as best you can, just strive will do. Because as we sit here today, um, what my mother is expressing about the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I'm like, what? who is this? Who is this woman? You know, and um, and my father 
Um, when he uh, 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 talked to Brother Robert just a few years ago, he apologized to him. He apologized to him because they, of course, didn't want us to get married and all that, but only because they didn't want to be um, look bad or be embarrassed. My mother said, we have to do the wedding. It has to be beautiful. It has to be right because she didn't want others to look at her um, badly. So, But they did not agree at all. They were not smiling in the pictures. <laughs> but, um, but so it was a hard time for them. But I thank a lot because now, and they, re they see it through the children, and they know it, that they did not do this. They have to bear witness that it was the teaching. So now they have so much respect for the nation and, um, and for Islam and for the Honorable Minister Lewis Park. It's really a, it was a complete 180. Yes, sir. So both of you all mentioned how you all accepted the teachers and, and really like in your teens, 19, right? Yes, sir. And you're here now, I know you're not 19 anymore. Not 19. Kind of so what, what, do, what, what, do you, what do you attribute? Like what would you share with believers that have helped you all to stay the course? Because we see, all of us can give stories about people that we know that have come, they were excited, they, 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 they struggled and you don't see them anymore. Some of them get the opportunity to make it back. Like what, what has kept you all on the path? I would say consistency, humility, and common sense. I'm a, I, I used to always say of myself, I'm, a, I'm a, a feet on the ground type of person. I can't live out in the stratosphere and, and out in space and whatnot. But like, how can what you're feeding me help me mm -hmm. in my life right now? Mm -hmm. If I'm not, if I can't pay my bills, if I can't, if it's not beneficial for my family, don't tell me about a day in which it's to come. Mm -hmm. I need to know how this benefits me now. And so being consistent, and when I say humble, or I should say being real, realistic, you know. Uh, when we were young and we were talking about getting married, <clears throat> contrary to what we present, there were many, not just our family, there were many Muslims that tried to convince us not to get married. Mm -hmm. And they were married themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but because of their experience, you know, they didn't, so, but the, I'm gonna tell you what really helped was that particular moment that I called the shock of the hour in my life, it propelled me to study and to keep my mind and my sight on the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So there were many people that I looked up to, you know, coming into the nation. Brother Collett was like a staple, and he would come to Texas all the time. He's from Houston, so he would come through Texas all the time. And so Brother Collett was the first example for me of a militant uh, brother, an FOI, student minister, and but you could see his demise and you could see his fall, but then at the same time having the example of the Honorable Minister mm -hmm. Louis Farrakhan exposing us to Malcolm's fall mm -hmm. helped. And so many of the uh, pitfalls that a lot of the believers fell into, I accredited, you know, I. I, I could, I, to some degree, I would say, I don't know. I don't know why certain things are so easy or they're easier. I won't say they're easy, but they seem to be easier for us than other people. And I don't really know why, but I can attribute it to a direct attempt to follow the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's guidance as it relates to self-development and how that has affected our union and our marriage and our family. I think that's the biggest thing because, um, and I've never saw, I never saw myself as a spiritual person mm -hmm. until I was married and we started having children. Mm -hmm. you know, when they came to me and said, well, you know, who's doing the, the teaching there? And some things happened with my brother, he was no longer present. Said I am. They said, "Well, you be the student minister." I said, "No, sir." <laughs> so you know, you know, in the nation, it came down to, "Well, you do it until you can find somebody." <laughs> we still looking, right? So, but I, I would just, 
you know, my advice would be to focus on the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and continue to study the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know, get everything you can get your hands on and just feed yourself. Uh, I used to go to bed listening to lectures on the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, who is God, pathology of hypocrisy, mm -hmm. just so much, so many things, believers are the beloved of Allah. Mm -hmm. um, anything I could get my hands on became uh, a part of my makeup and growth and development. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, I believe, how we've been able to stay um, the course, because so much has happened uh, in our lives but it's just been so e easy to overcome it. I don't, and I can't really say why, but I think that's why. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I would say I would attribute it to two things. One, you know, everyone, uh, Allah sets the path for bringing you to the nation. Everyone is different, and what keeps you here is different for, for everyone. And so, but for me, I have to say, that I really don't think had I um, been introduced to Islam in, in a mosque, an already established mosque, I don't know what that would have done for me personally. Because study group was everything. Right. Study group was like the place to be when I was when I was coming out. I mean, it was study group was packed and and the thing um, about Austin at that time is that everyone was young. They were young and they were really striving to, to be right. We were all around the same age. And so I, I was one who didn't have a lot of uh, female friends before I came in. So there was this immediate sisterhood and brotherhood and just genuine um, love. And because we didn't have the pressures uh, that come with once you're a mas, um, all of those pressures, we were just kind of free to grow naturally, organically. And so a study group became, we really studied the teachings. And we would, um, we would get together and when we even, um, uh, we would work in social events, you know, around studying the, we put on plays about the teachings and we had a Yaku play one time and, and you know we really just we got into it and so um, so we really studied the teachings of uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and it was it was uh, there was always a little righteous competition you know we would do um, uh, games and whatnot to see you know to challenge each other in the teachings so that was a blessing for me to come into a, a study group you know we were young there weren't too many who were even married at the time but they were getting married there were young couples and we really um, were close-knit and we had the freedom to socialize and do things like that so that really helped with, uh, with my growth was just coming into a study group um, and then being able to grow with the study group from there to a mosque status. And for some people, they would need, they need a mosque. They need that structure and to see everything, schools and this and everything set up, you know. But for me, I think that was the best thing that could have happened in my development was to come in into um, an environment like that. So you all, you know, we've been talking about family and you all, 22 years of marriage or 22? 22. 22. 22. Yes, so, you know, that's older than, older than your children. Yes, right? sir. So, <laughs> so how, like, you know, and was, when you think about it, if marriage was so easy, many people would be still married. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's one of the reasons right. why most people, like, don't run to marriage because of the difficulty. Mm -hmm. That's in the mosque mm -hmm. and yes, even outside the mosque, you know. Like, you would think in, in the nation you have more people running running toward it. I read an article, not an article, it was a letter that Malcolm X had wrote to the Mosaic Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about back then the, about the slowness of the brothers to want to get married. Mm -hmm. And he was attributing it to because of the great emphasis that's put on the woman and then put it on mm -hmm. marriage, right? So if it was because it's hard. Mm -hmm. So what is what are you what what has been some of the practical things that you all have done that has gotten you all to this twenty two it's 22 through this 23, 22 years. Um, I, you know, it's funny because for me, it hasn't been hard. And I, I can attribute that to having such a wonderful wife. Um, but All of our disagreements and all of our trials 
the tools that we use and the resources that we use to operate on them and to fix them, they come from the Holy Quran. They come from message to the black man. They come from the, the, the uh, lectures of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. And so since we have been in courtship, that was all, that's always been the source of our repair. It's always been the, the source. Anytime we had an issue, in order to resolve it, you know, if you just want to be angry, you can get to the angry. point where you want to resolve it because your family is your family. We always went back into the well and got water from where we had been getting it from. And so um, we've had some difficult times financially, you know. When we got married, I was uh, working a temporary job, making very little. And so when there were holidays, I couldn't work and I didn't get paid. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was maybe the first month after we got married, I got pneumonia. Mm -hmm. I couldn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, so it put us in, in, so to that end, we had no business getting married right. at that time. <laughs> but you know, you know, when you in love, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're, you're not gonna listen to, you, you're not gonna listen to people anyway. So, um, but because of that, but it's, it's, it's really been a character building type of situation, you know, to have, and to, for us to start with nothing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a very clear example of something that my wife told me one time. <laughs> so, you know, struggling every month to make ends meet, understanding and being reminded of what our roles and what our duties are in the marriage. The man is the maintainer, right? So that meant I had to work two jobs, I had to work two jobs. And so one time there was a bill due and there was a cutoff notice. And a few years later, a few months later, she told me, she said that she had the money one time. That she wasn't working, but she would work a job from time to time. We got pregnant immediately. <laughs> like we couldn't wait, right? So, so um, <laughs> And she, you know what she told me? She said that she had the money, it was a little bill. She had the money, but she didn't offer that money that she had to pay that bill because she believed that I would get the money to pay it. So that meant that she had to suffer in order to allow me to be a man, right? Which showed me how much character she had and how much belief she had in me upholding my responsibility and my duty as a husband because it's not just I got the money and I could easily pay it, but if, if the lights get turned off, the phone gets disconnected, the car gets repossessed, it, it's not just me suffering at not being the maintainer, but she has to suffer as well. And to have the money in her pocket and say, nope, he's going to find a way to get it, you know, that takes a lot. And so I understood that early, and I'll never forget, I was sitting in the car, and I don't know if I shared this with her before or not, but... I was sitting in the car a couple of blocks away from the mosque building that we had at the time, and I was in tears because I was trying to figure out how to make uh, some ends meet, right? Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't figure that. And one day I was at home, I was looking at the bills, and she just, which kind of angered me, but <laughs> she took the bills and she took them away from me, put them to the side. She said, don't worry about it, dog. we'll get it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know something <laughs> But, so to that end, it hasn't been, that, it has, really hasn't been difficult. And I don't know why it hasn't been that difficult. Now, I can't speak for her. She about to you speak. Know, cause, <laughs> you know, because the deal with me is something different. But, you know, I, um, um, I made it a point to always, you know, no matter how bad the situation got, I'm coming home every day. No matter how bad the situation got, I'm not going to my mother's house. I'm not talking to my mother or my father about my relationship with my wife. I'm not trying to get anybody to take my side. Then, as a student laborer, now the student minister, you know, I hear ministers say all the time, who does the minister talk to when he has problems? But my mind immediately goes to, who does my wife talk to? She's married to the student minister. So she can't go in the MGT class and confide in a sister when she has problems with me, right? Because that damages the view of the class about me. So we, we, we're stuck in this position 
primarily so that we can rely on Allah and the guide and use the tools that he gave us. So uh, it's hard for me, uh, but I do know anytime brothers come, from, come to me, they have problems with their wives, it always ends up being it's a problem that it's a problem with them because I always question them about their responsibility and how they could have prevented something from happening with their wives. So a lot of brothers don't like to come and speak with me about <laughs> you know the problem that they have with their, their, their spouse. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I you know the goodness the 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 t having studied. Um, marriage before starting our courtship or during our courtship as well and what the minister said some things just really did stick with me i understood that marriage is not just you know all roses all of the time and it's not it's not going to be easy all the time it's supposed to be a challenge it's supposed to be mm -hmm. difficult and so um having that from the onset even though it's really hard to even imagine that when you're getting married it's like Please, we got this, you know. <laughs> but but I knew in the back of my mind that it was going there were going to be challenges coming up. And so um, and so we something we've never done, even when I mean, you know, and we've gone there, you know, we've gone there. But but we've never it's never even been um, the word divorce, separate it just don't come up. That is not even we're in this, you know, um, and we took our we took our vows seriously, and so we have to figure out how we gonna make whatever the challenge is work. But I'm really blessed to have a husband that has never called me out of my name, ever called me out of my name. He's never he's never been abusive verbally, physically, any of that. And so, um, and I'm blessed to, for him to be like that because he is, I, it's so funny because I see him with, <laughs> with people sometimes with brothers or whatever and they're going, and I'm just like, wow, <laughs> I know you had that in you. But, um, but I see him when he gets upset, you know, I've seen him upset, but it's never, um, it's never been aggressed or, uh, or put towards me. And so I've always known that whatever it is, you know, sometimes we have to put conversations out for a while, you know, and we, and we're taught that in the MGT to be careful with our timing and our use of language. But that really is what's helped is that I've always felt safe and that I could say what I needed to say if I need to cry, I can cry, you know, whatever needs to, to, to happen, I felt, I felt safe. I didn't think that he was, um, I was never thought that he would beat me up, um, you know, with, uh, with words or language or, you know, with his hands, of course. So, um, so that's really been helpful that we just, we, we've decided that we're going to be in this no matter, you know, you know, what comes. And so I think we also um, discussed certain things that were absolute deal breakers, you know, before we got married. And so we knew challenges would come, but there were just some things that this happened. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> but we talked about that before we got married. And so, and we, we and, and praise be to a lot that that hasn't ever come. But there's some things that I didn't know that I would be able to get through if it happened. So we, so we discussed that during courtship. That I can stick to anything, but this right here. <laughs> if this happens, I, I don't know if I can get through that one. So, so we discussed. We were very real, you know, during our courtship process. Yes, sir. So, uh, two, two more questions. So, in, in your lecture in all through the week, you know, you were talking about family, and and you mentioned it today in the lecture. You talked about like the conversion, conversion of our own children. Mm -hmm. So, like, what advice would you give those who who may have not a, achieved that yet? You know what I'm saying? Or is it too late? It's never too late um, because we have deposited the teachings in them to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing about this is that when we come to the mosque, we, we see each other, right? Yeah. But we don't see our shortcomings necessarily, mm -hmm. but our children do, our mm -hmm. spouses do and it affects them. And so I was reminded of, when you look at the first set of children that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had with Mother Clara Muhammad, and the struggle to establish the nation of Islam, 
they, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was dad for them. He was, he was not outright the messenger of Allah. He was still establishing that. So the poverty and the, him being on the run and all of those things had an effect on those beautiful children who would help him, but they would not stay the course entirely. But when you look at the children that he had with Mother Tynetta, who were introduced, yeah, that's your father, but your father is the messenger of Allah. Mm -hmm. So they had a certain perspective, and they didn't see that early Elijah Poole conversion into Elijah Kareem and the mm -hmm. Honorable Elijah Muhammad. They didn't grow up with that. They didn't grow up with the sour bean soup and, the, and him being on the run for the amount of time he was on. Uh, although they did, they did have their own trial sets of, of trials, but uh, so one is we can't destroy ourselves or beat ourselves up because we're coming up out of hell, yes. right? And so we do the best that we can, but when we have knowledge, a body of knowledge available, mm -hmm. and so you know we kind of talked about that. We got single brothers in the FOI, single sisters, but if when we know that they're single, we're not preparing them for marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not preparing them for, you know, we talk about marriage. We talk about you can't be single forever. We don't believe in the monkery. But if our curriculum and if our talks are not helping to shape them into a husband and then a father, then we're doing them a disservice. And so... Um, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> let me think of it. What was my question? No, I was just talking about every go like how do we, we go back and like if you, you know like you like some because you have some you see I don't know what the percentage is but it may be high it's, it's, where many yeah. that where many of the children don't accept the faith. I, I mean I, they may still consider themselves to be Muslim right. but they don't become yeah. active Muslims. And I'll tell you what disturbed me coming into yes. the post of student minister when I did an inventory of our student ministry class. Many of their wives were not in the nation, mm -hmm. and many of their children had not accepted and was helping. Mm -hmm. So we consciously said we want to produce. I'll never forget we had a conversation one day about being successful financially, but also being successful in being a ever-present FOI and MGT. Because when we were coming up, we saw when you were successful, you weren't that active. You know, when, when you were really active, you weren't that successful financially and otherwise. And so we wanted to break the mold of what we saw. So the same with our children. We wanted to purposely, everything that we did was geared toward ultimately their path to becoming a law. Would it, on that path, it would be them raising their hand and accepting the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But for those whose children have gotten lost, they shouldn't fret because they put Allah there. And Allah will bring them around in his own due time. And so they shouldn't condemn their children and they shouldn't condemn themselves because we all are coming up out of hell. And the only thing they can do for the mistakes that they made, they can apologize and atone for those things. But the children should also understand that I can't be a judge of my parents because my parents gave me life and they did the best for me that they could. And if nothing else, they gave me life. And so the parents should continue to reach out to them and, 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 and be the parents that they were not able to be. Because now they're wiser, right? And even if they can't reach the child that they raised, their children having grandchildren, they can reach them. And so maybe there's a delay in the generation, maybe. But I can tell you this, we'll never have a, we'll never have a nation if we keep starting over. Yeah. We got children that we rear, they're swine free, they're tobacco free, and then they go out into the world, and then we start over with somebody that's coming out of the world that already has that in their system and in their mind. And so at what point do we continue to process and we not have to start over uh, again? So, no, we should keep going, going to go get them. Yes, yes that's right. Yeah, yes, sir. I, I mean, I say the same thing. The scripture says, train up the child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. So don't, don't ever give up on your children. And so if they, uh, um, if they stray from this way of life, you know, there's nothing more powerful than the prayer of a mother for her children. And that is just so, um, 
that's a very, I mean, you can touch it, it's tangible. And so pray for your children, particularly mothers should pray for their children. And they, and I believe that if you put um, good in them, it will at some point, it's going to sprout and they're going to, um, they're going to return to what they know is right, um, even if they deviate. But for those who are bringing children up, one of the things that we did was we, we really trusted the teachings. We trusted that what we were taught about how to rear our children was right and correct. So if the world is pulling and saying, do this with your children or do that, but the teaching says, no, we don't, you know, we don't, that's, that's not something that we do. We trusted the teachings that our children will be okay if we went this way. And so um, there were certain things that we were careful to keep them away from because we knew that that would lead to, um, um, you know, possibly them, them straying. But the teachings are right and exact. And, you know, the thing that also helped, I have to say, with um, our children you know, Brother Nuri said, said it like this. He said, um, the child of a Muslim is not necessarily a Muslim child. And he said that we can't learn Islam through osmosis. Our children can't learn it through osmosis. And so I heard that later, but, um, but we implemented that early. And what I mean is that we taught our children Islam like you would teach a brand new believer. And so I wanted, we didn't have a school, we have children, and I wanted my children to know the teachings as well as the academics that they were learning in school. And so I thought other people may want that for their children too. And so I remember creating an email and sending out a mass email to all of the believers and saying, I'm going to start a little Saturday school, you know, and, um, and I wanted my children, because children learn better around other children. Um, and um, and they, they lo really love Saturday school. And so, but I said, I don't know everything, but I'm going to share what I do know with the children. So at least they'll at least know what we know. And so we started a Saturday school, and they were, God, they were little when we started um, the Saturday school, but they all came up through that Saturday school, the Believer's Children, through, and it was just on Saturdays. Um, in the summers, we would do like extended um, um, time because, you know, people were out for school and we would do fields. We did as much as we could, but we focused on the teachings because they were getting the academics in whatever schools they were in, private schools, charter schools, or whatnot. So it was the teachings, and they studied the teach. We had final exams. We did. It was it was a school as best as we could do it, and we'd been in different locations. Wherever we could, sometimes somebody house or wherever we could, we would just have a Saturday school, and um, so a lot of the, um, the believers who, who stuck with that Saturday school, we see that they'll, when they got older and they turned 16, they raise their hand. Because one of the things, you know, we don't put the pressure, we don't say you have to, but I definitely let them know, when you turn 16, that, that's your chance, to, that's, the, that's the age of decision. In the, in, the, in the nation is 16. And so we let them know that that's your opportunity to accept you know, for yourself. So our children were very clear. We wanted active registered Muslims, but they were going to have to choose it for themselves because they understood the law and you're going to be bound by that law and that has to be your decision. So um, by the grace of God, you know, we, we did those things and they, um, our two oldest accepted and shall, my daughter's 15, she'll be 16 in July, inshallah, she'll accept as well and move forward and we expect the same. But my little one, Halim, who was seven, he, he gets mad when we have to cancel, um, sat, which has become Sunday school just because of logistics with, um, with our uh, building, but um, we do it on Sundays now. But when he hears we have, because uh, maybe a special guest is coming or whatnot, and I say, you know, we're, we're not going to have <laughs> Sunday school today, then they, they a little, little, you know, they want to come to, to Sunday school. So, and it's because they get to be with one another. And I'll say this in close. We visited elevated places in Houston, and I was trying to explain, because our children came up later, because it was a Friday and they had school and work. And um, I was trying to explain to Halim, who's seven, where I was going to be. 
And I was describing ele elevated place. I said, it's like MUI, you know, but it's, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> he said, so it's all day. They have school. So like where I go to school, but it's MUI and it's all Muslims. And, and he was like, how come I can't go to that school? You know, he was, he was, and then, no, his first words were, that's not fair, you know, because he wanted that same type of school. So if you create it where you do, with whatever resources you, you, you have, but make it as enjoyable and as fun as you can. And there's so much in the teachings. There's so many wonderful, um, I hate to call them stories, but um, um, things you can give, history you can give to the children. And our children, you don't have to convince them that it's true. They're born knowing that that's true. You don't have to. So it's not about it's not about convincing them that it's true. It's giving them the understanding. Because what happens is a lot of times they just know stuff through meetings and hearing stuff, but they don't understand the why we do stuff. And if we don't know the why behind what we do, they won't stick with it when they leave. You know, so we have to teach them um, the why to the lessons, um, as well as, you know, you memorize them first, but then you get into the understanding of it. So it's just, it's a lot of things that um, we can really do with our children, um, even though we don't have these great facilities yet. But I, I really attribute, uh, attribute that to our children um, staying in Islam and finding a love for Islam and then, you know, finding their own uh, connection uh, to Allah. And I yes, wanted sir. to add this really quick. When she talks about that Saturday school piece and giving final exams and stuff, like the children, they're there, right? And so we have certain believers that go and they participate, they teach a class, right? But I, I didn't really understand the magnitude, right? She showed me the curriculum. Whatever. So she asked me to print the final exam one time. Right? <laughs> it had 200 questions wow. on the final yeah. exam. So. And then you had certain students that always got hundreds. Mm -hmm. Like, like it's, I mean, oh, they competed so, with each so, other. and that's what they did in class. They would mm -hmm. compete with one another. And so when I saw that crop of children coming up and I saw what they knew, I'm, I'm looking, I'm reading the final exam saying, I don't know that one. <laughs> I don't know this one. But so they have to be taught just like everybody right. else. They, they, just that's because they live in a house with us, it doesn't mean anything. But I saw the, I saw the, the, the degree of teaching that was being done for them. And so right now, they're, they're more versed in the teachings of Honorable Elijah Muhammad than many of the adults that's been around for 20, 30 years. So we're going to do this last question, because I know they got to get out here, got to get out by 2.30. Um, so just, we always want to get testimony about the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You all have had the opportunity to to, to, to meet him and, yes, and greet him. I know Brother Robert has been at the table several times and you had the opportunity yes, in Atlanta. Sir. Yes, sir. So, you know, what can you testify <coughs> about the Alma Mr. Lewis Farrakhan's mm -hmm. love, his character, mm -hmm. whatever comes to mind when you just hear that, that question? Mm -hmm. What we see in the public, we see in private. Mm -hmm. His immense love for the people, for black people. First for Allah, mm -hmm. his Christ, and then for our people, you know, you see that and it's so sincere in every word that he shares, his disposition, his sacrifice, you know, and I'm just honored to have the opportunity to know, I mean, there's, there's tens of thousands of believers throughout time, maybe more than what I'm saying, that was around during the days of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they never got a chance to meet them. And so I'm blessed to have the opportunity to have met the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and my family as well. And so we don't take it as a, uh, we don't take that for granted because he shares some very good words with the children and my wife. And so, but his character is, is impeccable. He is, uh, he's an honorable man. And so, uh, you know, to have met him we have a responsibility and a duty to bear witness to that um, and to share that with people. You know, too often when people get comfortable with the minister, they don't share a lot of their experiences with him. You know, and those experiences could help a struggling believer that has fallen on hard times with their faith and their condition. And we just kind of take for granted that we have the opportunity. It's not like we, 
you know, you and I are with him all the time. Like some people may have the opportunity to be more, but uh, so every chance I get, um, if I have some notes that I can share, I always come back and I share them with the believers so that the believers can be assisted uh, with any of that information. So um, it is truly like the scripture when there's people just wanted to touch the hem of the garment of one that came to save, one that was born to save. And so just to be acquainted with him, I find it difficult to understand how after being brought to life, because there was a stage when I was coming in where I was given a Holy Quran, and I had that in the top shelf of my closet in my mother's home, but I had a pack of crack cocaine in the bottom in my shoes. Mm -hmm. And I was at a, 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 a crossroad in my life of whether I was going to take the high road or mm -hmm. I was going to take the low road. Mm -hmm. And it was because the Honorable Louis Farrakhan that I took the high road, and I'm still here today uh, as a living witness of his character and what his teaching and his word can do for you. That's right. Praise be to Allah. It, it was um, the honor and the privilege of a lifetime just to touch his hand. Mm -hmm. They're real soft, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they so, they yeah. so soft. And so it took every, oh my goodness, I, it took every just fiber of my being to keep from crying. Cause, and I didn't want to cry because I wanted to listen to what he was saying and I wanted to take it in. Um, and so it was a struggle, but I was able to, especially when he hugged Halim, I was just about to just fall apart. But, um, but uh, I have to say this also that had I never met the minister, that would have been okay with me. Um, it was, it was, and I'm beyond grateful to have that opportunity. Um, and it's only been once, and if it never happens again, I, I mean, it, it didn't need to happen. But I'm grateful that it did happen because we love the minister for what he has given. All you don't have to be this close to him for him to feed you and for him to give you what you need to make it. And so I love the minister so much, and I I owe him my life. I really do. The life of my ooh, I'm not gonna get emotional. Go ahead. But Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. we understand. Yeah. We do. Mm -hmm. now, we all are crying. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. No, but but um you know, I love my children and my family and they are they exist because of the men because he gave himself, he sacrificed himself. And I love his family because they didn't get the father that they wanted and every child wants so we can have. That's it. Uh, any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, so but man, this was, uh, as I was thinking when we when I said when I post, I want to tell people I really wish you all take the time to watch this because this was real good. Man. Yeah, I think it was practical. Like we've been talking about all of this weekend, you know, I believe that many believers, we hear the teachers, we know the teachers, but even outside the nation, but people still want to see examples. You know, like in the lessons, the Master Farah Muhammad said, he says, uh, study, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, uh, study the apostle and through him you will see the light. Because you're going to see somebody that's you're going to see it. It's just not in the theory of seeing somebody. So like the stuff that you all shared this weekend, dealing with your children and with yourselves, is we have to see it so believers can actually hear because we, we all are books. Yes, that's that's right. I was thinking while we were sitting here. So thank you all. Thank man. We you. really thank enjoyed you. it. safe journey back home. Thank you so, so this much. This concludes it. We're going to, uh, inshallah, hopefully we'll be able to put it up tonight. So thank you all as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.